Well, good morning. You doing all right? If you're not, I hope you will be by the time the service is over. And if not, that's your fault. No, it's not your fault. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not your fault. So last week we talked about uh, a clean slate, making a clean slate, making a new start. And uh, this week we're going to talk a little bit about how to maintain that clean slate. Because it's awesome that you have one, but now how do you maintain it? Because that's the way that sin works. That's the way your life works. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I, it's rhetorical because I already probably know the answer. But have you ever felt trapped? <laughs> hey, I got a laugh in the front. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, trapped in your sin, trapped in a relationship, trapped in a job, trapped in a town, trapped in whatever. We've all felt trapped at some point, and sometimes we get trapped in our sin. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about getting out of that. When my, uh, I called my mother this week, and I said, Mom, I, I kind of vaguely remember this story a little bit, but I need, I sort of need the nuts and bolts of it so you can, you can tell me uh, exactly what happened. So when she was a kid, she was playing, my mom grew up in the, in the 50s. And so some of you are like, what, the 50s? I don't even know there was time back then. Yes, children, there was time back then. And so I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and it was the Wild West, so you can only imagine what the 50s was like. It was, yeah, you didn't even exist. They were like, well, they show up eventually. That's kind of was the 80s. But my mom said they were playing hide-and-seek when she was little. Anybody ever play hide-and-seek? All right, we're going to cut out the lights right now, and we're going to do it. Brandon, go hide. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no, I'm scared of the dark. So look, and so my mom said they were playing hide-and-seek, and they counted it off. And she was getting ready to run. I also didn't tell you that it was nighttime when they were playing hide and seek. And I also didn't tell you that they were playing in a graveyard. And so, ooh, oh, scary. Some of you are like, oh, that's crazy. We used, to, we used to run around a graveyard all the time. Did anybody else ever run around a graveyard when you were your kid? Look, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. You could do whatever you wanted. People were like looking at it. The, the guy would come out with like the flashlight and you would hide. It was awesome. No, don't do that. So my mom was in a graveyard. And they counted her off, and they said, all right, go. And my mom said she took off running, and she couldn't see anything. And she went face down into an open grave. No body in the grave. Don't freak out. But apparently in the 50s, they just left freshly dug graves wide open to trap children. And so my mom was in there, and she's little, and she can't get out. And so she's screaming, help, help. And she said nobody could hear her, and it seemed like forever. And they finally came to get her, and they helped her out, and she was freaked out. Look, that's how I feel sometimes with sin. I feel like I'm just like, help, help, and nobody hears me. Have you ever felt that way? Come on. It's not just me. You're like, no, I never, I don't, well, you, of course, Pastor, but I don't sin. So I've never had that particular issue. Okay, well, maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's just a problem. Maybe it's just a job. Maybe it's a relationship. And I said this first service, I want to be super clear about this. When I say, have you ever felt trapped in a relationship, I don't want you to come to me after service and be like, man, Pastor, thank you so much. I was praying. I was going to leave that woman. And I was like, man, God, you just give me, you tell me. You give me the word today and I'm out. That's not the word today. I want you to be super clear. God is telling you to stay in that and work through it. So there you go. So don't come up. I didn't hear that part, Pastor. I only heard the get out part. Sin is an open grave. It's just an open grave. It's always there. It's always present. There's always a problem. Sometimes we feel trapped in that. And so how do we avoid it? How do we not fall into that? How do we walk around that? Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We get around that. First off, we have to identify our weaknesses. Identify your weakness. What is your weakness? What is something you struggle with? What is something that's like, ah, man, I, I do have a problem with that. Because here's the thing. It, it, you're not going to realize you have a problem until you figure out what the problem is. Because your family's like, oh, this guy, he's got problems. My wife's here today. Ooh. My wife just went, hmm? My wife's over there. I got to be careful. 
there are two stories later in the sermon about her, so just saying. Probably wasn't a good day to show up. So, <laughs> but listen, you have to identify the problem. That's the first step. That's the first step with anything. I, I was, uh, I used to be an alcoholic. And some people, and it's totally fine if you do this, they stand up in meetings and say, uh, this is my name and I'm an alcoholic. I don't do that because I'm not that anymore. Because God delivered me from that and I'm super excited about that. And so it's just different for me. And it's totally fine. It's totally fine if you stand up and you say, I am an alcoholic so because it's like something I struggle with and I want to keep it in the forefront. I want to remember that that's a problem. That's totally fine. I used to be a drunk, and so I had to identify that problem because until I knew what that problem was, until I said, hey, this is a problem, when all of my friends and family around me were going, hey, this is a problem. You are going to die if you don't stop. But it wasn't until I went, yeah, you're right. So you need to identify that problem, identify your weakness first. Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument for evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You have to recognize your temptations. And so first you have to say, okay, these are my problems. And then when you're tempted with certain things, you have to go, oh, okay, that's a temptation. That's a temptation. I probably, I probably shouldn't, I probably shouldn't be around that. I told a story first service, and it was, it was. I read it a long time ago, and it's one of my favorite stories. Two older dudes, and they were like pastors or something, and they were in an airport. And I'm thinking it's Las Vegas because you'll understand here in a second. And so a, a a woman of ill repute came up to them and tried to say, hey. Y'all new to Vegas? I got, I got, you got any money? And so the one guy, as they're standing there, two older dudes, the one guy went and just started running, the other guy said. He was just ran down the airport. And so his friend is standing there like, do I run? What is happening? Is this bad? Is there something chasing us? What is happening right now? And later he was like, I don't, what just happened? That was crazy. And he's like, man, I can't, even, I can't even be around that. I can't even be around that. And that's how we have to treat our sin. We have to recognize the temptation and then just go, I'm out. Just get out. And I don't know what your temptation is. Because sometimes when we think temptations, we're like, well, pastor, I'm not a drunk. And I don't do drugs. And I'm not a pornographer. I don't do any of that stuff. Are you a gossip? Are you a liar? quiet. Some of you are like, I don't do any. Hey, I'll do a couple of those things. You've got to recognize your temptations. Verse 14 says, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And that's part of the problem sometimes. We think, okay, the law was Old Testament. There was a lot of law. There were Ten Commandments, and okay, we got that. And then Jesus showed up in the New Testament, and it's all grace and love and peace, and we can do whatever we want. Incorrect. Incorrect. You need to be squarely in the middle, both of those. You have to have enough of the law and enough of grace to understand, oh, this is a middle ground. There are a list of things that I probably shouldn't do, but even if I screw up and do those, God is going to love me. That doesn't give you a license to do whatever you want. Because some people go, well, I have a clean slate now, Pastor. I prayed, and I asked Jesus to forgive me. And then um, I was totally fine. And then two days later, I was right back in it. It's like, no, that's not, that's not what this is about. you got to be squarely in the middle of both of those things because both of those things are great. Genesis 4, 7b says, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. You have to confront your sinful desires. You have to go, okay, this is sin. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to stop this right here. I know that it's out. I, I know that the devil's always after me. I know that it, sin is crouching at the door. I'm, don't do, stay away from me. Stay away from me. And you're like, Pastor, I can't, I can't do that on my own. I can't, I'm too weak. And I get that. I get it. And here's the thing. You are. You are too weak. You can't do it on your own. And that's okay. 
That's why Jesus came and died for us and rose again so you can have help. First story on my wife. She's going to hear, you said I could leave. And that's what she's going to say at the end of the story. So it, we were two years, there was, there was two years uh, previous in my house that there was a lot of, can we get a dog? And for two years, I was steadfast. I was, earned, I was, a, good, I was a good, solid man. No dogs. We're not going to have a dog. There won't be another dog in this house. I'm sick of dogs. We've had 100 dogs, and they've all been dumb dogs, and I don't like dogs. Cut to, we have a dog. <laughs> Cut to, my wife said, oh, I, I said, I said, listen, if we're going to get a dog, I want it to be, uh, I would like a Belgian Malinois. And so they said, okay, we have this one at a rescue. It's a Malinois. And he's like 40 pounds right now. He's only going to get to be 60 pounds. I said, all right, let's try that dog. The first dog we got, crazy murder dog, had to send it back, didn't work, had it for like two days, ran off. We chased it around the neighborhood. That's a whole nother story. Remember I said I didn't want a dog? So the dog, like a 40-pound dog, it was only going to be 60 pounds, this dog. That dog is 100 pounds, 100-plus pounds. And he's not like a big like, oh, you just fed that dog too much, and he's only supposed to be a 60-pound dog, and now he's a 100-pound dog. No, he's got German Shepherd in him, and he's a monster. And so that dog is, <laughs> man, one of the greatest dogs on the planet. I said, listen, I, if we get this dog, two things. One, well, I don't, the only two things I care about, I want to train it in German because it's super cool, like in the movies, and I get to name it. So I named it Preacher, and he is the best dog. We have a little kid, and she's like almost two, and that kid mugs that dog. Just flops on him like a beanbag, yanks his ears. She poked him in the eyes the other day, and he's like, eh. And he's totally fine. He's the best dog until he turns on the murder dog switch. And I always said, look, if we get a dog, I don't want a dog that I can't fight. Like, if I have to fight a dog, if that dog goes crazy, I want, like, a little dog that I could just go, get away from me, little dog. There's no, look, if this, if this dog turns it on, there's big problems. This dog will come after you. He's got a super mean bark, and he never barks, which, again, great dog. Unless somebody sketchy is at the door, and then he's like, hoo, hoo, hoo. and I'm like, ah, oh, the neighbor's got a real mean dog. That dog sounds crazy, and I'm like, oh, that dog's my dog. But that's the thing I want Jesus to be. Look, I'm going to show a picture in a second. Because when my dog gets his hackles up, that's what it's called. He, his, I saw him in the yard one day, and he saw another dog, and his, just, his fur went up on the back, and he just rah, 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 through the yard. And I was like, huh. somebody let a werewolf loose in our backyard. So this picture is scary, children. So if you're children, look away. Don't wait. We got little kids. Don't let that little, don't let that little dude look. Show me that picture. Look, man, that's, that's not my dog, but that's what I thought of my dog was that day. I'm like, that dog's a werewolf. We're all going to die in here. But look, that's what I want Jesus to be. I want Jesus to be in our relationship like I can just be with him and he has so much grace and so much love and he just loves to be around me. But then when I need protection from sin and from the devil and from the stuff that's crouching at the door, he shows up and says, look, not my kid. Get away from him. That's, you're not going to mess with that kid right now. And then I can just step back and go, yeah, he's scary. Because that's what Jesus is. Sometimes we, we like to think, oh, Jesus is so nice. He wore a bathrobe and Birkenstocks, and he just walked around just throwing love and rainbows to everybody. Hello, I'm Jesus. Look, man, I want my Jesus to fight for me. I want my God to fight for me. They don't call him the Lion of Judah for nothing. He's for you, not against you. Confront your sinful desires. Romans 7, 18 through 25 says, this is Paul writing, by the way, the guy that wrote most of the New Testament. And you think, oh, Paul's a good dude, man. We follow that guy. He's awesome. He says some great things, and this is fantastic. 
Paul says, and I know that nothing good lives in me. What? What kind of a trash? That's not good, Paul. That is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Have you ever felt like that? It's like, look, Pastor, I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm trying to do it, but I always mess up. I always do what's wrong. It's just, it's tough. I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Again, we talked about it a little bit earlier. You need to avoid known sources of temptation. Is that a problem? If you're a drunk, don't go to a bar. It, it sounds like common sense, but you're like, but they, all my friends are there. Well, if you're trying to stop drinking, don't go there. If you're trying to stop gossiping, maybe get off Twitter or Facebook. But you don't understand, Pastor. I got to get on there and I got I to, I got some things to say. What I have to say is important. No, it's not. I was trying to think about how to say that for a second, and I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to give it to you. No, it's not. You're like, well, here's what I think. Here's exactly what I think. I think the president should. Whoop de doo. What do you think? Any president ever is like, well, maybe Trump because he was on Twitter a bunch. But he's not looking and going, oh, they're right. You know, uh, somebody in the Toma said, I'm an idiot, and here's what I should. We're going we're gonna to go on ahead and change policy. I got this tweet today, and it's pretty, pretty good, pretty interesting. Look, man, nobody cares. All you're doing is getting yourself worked up. With gossip and nonsense and <laughs> do you wake up and you're like, oh man, I gotta check my, I gotta check my feed? Or do you wake up and go, hey, I need to feed my soul and start praying and reading the Bible? Because there's a difference. There's a huge difference. Verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Man, Paul, you're really awesome. Thank you so much. Who will free me from this life that is dominated? By sin and death. There's an old, uh, it's attributed to a Cherokee parable and a grandfather's talking to his grandson, which I am a grandfather now. So I'm going to tell my grandson this one day when he's old enough. I'll be like, hey, I invented this story because I'm awesome. No, I'm not going to do that. Pap, pap, you're a liar. So yeah, sorry. But it, it's a Cherokee thing. And the grandfather says to the grandson, he's like, look, there, there are two wolves living within you. And they're fighting to win. One of them is full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness. It's self-control. It's, it's all full of all the good things. And the other one is trying to destroy all of those good things. And one of them is going to win. And the little boy says, Grandfather, what, which one is going to win? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. Whichever one you feed is going to be the winner. So if you starve the sin one to death, by spending so much time with Jesus, that's a win. That's the one that's going to win. That's the one you want. That's why I like what Paul says here. Verse 25, thank God. I'm like, man, Paul was busting my chops for a minute. Thank you for the thank God exclamation point. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. 2 Corinthians 10, 5b says, And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We need to practice self-restraint. I, I literally picture this in my mind like an actual thing. Like if something comes in my head and the devil's like, Hey, you should do this. I picture myself in my head going... 
okay, is that something I need to be doing? Is that something I need to be messing with? No, I don't want that. Take every thought captive. You're going to have thoughts all the time. You're like, well, I don't sin anymore, Pastor. I'm saved. The Lord has cleaned my slate and it's all good. Look, I wish it was. Look, if it was, we would all be Christians. Everybody would be a Christian. If it was easy, if once you said, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, God was like, okay, smooth sailing from here on out. That is not the way it works. It's a mess. And when you decide, hey, I am going to follow Jesus, then the devil goes, oh, no. We're going to go get that one. Because if you're not doing anything, I'm just being honest with you. If you're just like, yeah, I'm saved, eh. The devil's like, all right, whatever. I'm not doing anything. I already lost you. I'm not going to mess with you, though, because you're not doing anything. You're not talking to anybody. You're not trying to reach out. You're not trying to tell people about me. So who cares? Do whatever you want. But when the devil starts busting your chops, you're like, ooh, I think I'm doing something right. This just got hard. This just got difficult. This just got crazy. Practice self-restraint. Where do you go when you're weak? Because you're weak. And sometimes that's when the devil shows up, by the way. The devil doesn't ever show up when you're super stoked about worship and you're like, yeah, that was great. Woo, church. High five, everybody. That's amazing. The devil's like, all right, hang on. The devil hits you in the middle of the week. And you're like, man, I just don't even think I can do one more day of this. I'm so tired. I'm so worn out. This whole thing has just got me so frustrated. I, I feel like I'm trapped in my sin. I feel like I'm trapped in this life. I feel like I'm trapped in all this, and I can't do anything about it. And then the devil shows up and goes, well, I, I have the answer. And then you go, what, what is it? That's when you have to take every thought captive. Because the devil comes at you when you're weak. He's not stupid. Sometimes, we th- sometimes I feel like we think the devil's stupid. We're like, he's dumb. He takes vacations. He takes breaks. He doesn't always. No, he's always at you. Sin is crouching at the door all the time. Where do you go when you're weak? Psalm 91.4. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Jesus speaks this. He says, Luke 13.34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I had wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. Like, what? That's weird. Didn't you just say Jesus is like some crazy protector and not like some weird chicken guy? I I don't think chicken man sounds very exciting. Chicken man God isn't very good. Again, second story from my wife. We live in a suburb, one of those one of those houses where you can reach out of your bathroom and get toilet paper from your neighbor's bathroom. Because it's so close. My wife said, my wife wants to live on a farm, period. I would live in the city tomorrow. My wife wants to live on a farm. We did live on a farm at one point. I feel like you had your time. And so... She said, I want some chickens. Now, if you were paying any attention at all to the dog story, you would know that now there are chickens at my house. And those chickens are dum-dums, and I'm like, I don't want to necessarily compare Jesus to a chicken, to a hen. That doesn't sound right. But there are four kinds of calls that a mother hen makes to her chicks. One, when night is falling. One when danger is around, one when food is found, and four when she just wants to be with her kids. And so Jesus is like, look, so many times I've just wanted to gather you like a mother hen. I just want to guard you. I just want to be with you. I want to let you know that danger is coming. I want to let you know that night is coming, but I want you to know that I will protect you. That's the Jesus that we have. He's the Lion of Judah. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He has you. He has your back. If you feel like I can't, Pastor, I can't, great message, but I can't get out of where I am. I'm stuck. Nobody's coming to save me. I've asked. I've, 
cried out, please come and help me. Nobody will come. Jesus will come. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to help you out of that grave of sin. Because he defeated that grave. So you don't have to live there. Sin is an open grave. But you don't have to live there. You don't have to be trapped in it. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And what will you do with your clean slate? I didn't do this first service. I'm going to do it this way. I want everybody just to close your eyes if you can. It's a time of you and Jesus, okay? I want you to, if you feel like you're trapped in a situation, if you feel like you're trapped in your sin, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Nobody looking around. Just raise your hand. Right where you are. All right, you can put your hands down. Thank you. God, we love you so much. We just thank you, Father, that you have our back. We thank you that you have our future. You have a plan and a purpose for us. God, we thank you that when we need a protector, you are there. When we need a hand up out of the grave, you are there. When the sin that we are caught in, when the sin that we are trapped in, when the situation that we feel like we're trapped in is overwhelming, you are there. You go before us and you are a rear guard. And God, I just pray for protection this week. For those that have raised their hands, God, I pray that they would hear you clearly, they would see you clearly, they would understand that they don't have to live there anymore. The grave that they are in is not eternal. Your love is. Help them to cry out to you, Jesus. And save them this week, right now, God, right as we're talking. Pull them out of that pit, God. Love you. We thank you. In your name, amen, amen. Thank you so much for coming to the crossing. We hope you have a wonderful week. Amen.